remain standing. We'll be in Revelation chapter 12 this morning, Revelation chapter number 12. We'll look at several verses here today. You'll be encouraged and helped. I know this morning it's a message that will apply and be helpful for all of us today. Revelation chapter number 12, Revelation chapter number 12, and I'll begin reading for us in verse number 7. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, right at the back of your Bible, last book in our New Testament, Revelation 12, verse number 7. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world was cast out of the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, you will see, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Heavenly Father, this morning as we allow the Word of God to teach us and instruct us, I pray that each of our hearts and lives would be helped because of being in church this morning. Uh, Lord, we do pray that you would guide, uh, Lord, my, about my lips, thy servant, and Lord, our listening ears, or that we would hear, Lord, we'd apply, and our lives would be helped. Uh, because of this day. Lord, thank you so much for all that you do for us. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Verse number 10, the Bible says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, the kingdom of God, and the power of his Christ. I want you to notice the next phrase here where the Bible says, For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. The accuser of our brethren is cast down. You understand that Satan is known as the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. In other words, he accuses us of our sins before God. Satan doesn't want God to extend his grace. He doesn't want God to extend his forgiveness to any of us. And so through his deception, he wants us to accept the shame and guilt of bearing that weight in of ourselves, of how unworthy we are, of how bad we are, of how undeserving that we truly are. In the book of Job, Satan stood before God to accuse Job of having an insincere love for God. He said to God, Satan said to God, you know why Job serves you, don't you? He says, the only reason he serves you is because, I mean, you, you've put a hedge about him and you've been so good to him, he is prosperous and he has so much wealth and, and goodness. And, and no, who wouldn't serve God uh, if, uh, if you weren't that way? Of course, God knew that was not the reason that Job served him. And so God gave Satan limited leeway to be able to inflict um, uh, Job with all types of tragedies that would come into his life, the loss of his health and the children that would die and his wife would turn on him, his cattle and his lands and all of that would be taken from him and and, of course, he was, he was, was accusing Job of uh, not being serving God for the right reason. Well, we realize, knowing the story, that the accusations were wrong. And uh, Job did serve God. In fact, he says, though he slay me, I'm still going to trust God. I'm still going to obey God. I'm still going to follow God. I'm still going to love God in spite of the hardships and trials that Job had to go through. And so we see Satan wants to remind the people of God of their failures and of their shortcomings, and of their sins. And he's a master at it. He's a master at it. And if he can get us to focus on how bad we are, how bad we've been, all the mishaps and mistakes that we've made in our lives, then he, he, he paralyzes us from being able to ever be truly used in any capacity for good, for God, and for God's purpose. And he wants to convince us uh, that we're not worthy of the recipients of God's goodness and blessings in our lives. And again, I, I want to agree with that statement, we're not worthy of any of the blessings that God gives us. And uh, the recipient that we are, God's mercy has made it available to us. It's not by my righteousness, 
that, uh, that we have any goodness in our lives. It's not by your righteousness that you have any goodness in your life. Uh, it's not by any good deeds that we've ever done. It's all according to His mercy, His grace, His love, His kindness. His, I mean, it's, it's all God. And we ought not to ever expect that. But Satan takes that uh, undeserving of, of any usefulness or blessings of God to a, to a, a demonic level uh, to where we become our own worst enemy. Uh, before we beat guilt up, though, this morning, as that's what I want to talk about, the, my, the title of the message today is Silencing the Accuser. Silencing the Accuser. The voice that, uh, that robs you of your joy, the voice that reminds you of all the things you've done wrong, the voice uh, that uh, tells you how bad you are, how bad of a, a dad you were, how bad of a mom you were, how bad of a husband or wife you were, how bad of a son or a daughter you were, how bad we were, the, de- the voice in our mind, that guilt that comes in our heart, we want to silence the accuser. Before we get to that, that lesson this morning, I want, to, I, I want to focus on and remind us that guilt uh, for the most part, is a very constructive thing, the right kind of guilt. Because there's two types of guilt. There's a true guilt, a good guilt, a right kind of guilt that's beneficial for all of us, and there's the bad guilt, uh, the evil, the wrong guilt that is very counterproductive, very destructive for us. True guilt is a good emotion. Uh, you see, whenever you sin, uh, it's a bad thing, and it should leave us feeling guilty when you've done that bad thing. All of, all of our sins, and the uh, Bible says we're all unrighteous, and there's none righteous, no, not one. And, and so when I do wrong, uh, there's that guilt. There ought to be a guilt because uh, it's never right to do wrong. And uh, we can justify it. We can sort of act like it's not a big deal and push it to the side and says everybody else uh, is doing it, but it's still wrong. It's still bad. And guilt is that emotion that reminds us and says, you, you shouldn't have said that. That was unkind. That was uncalled for. You didn't need to act that way. You didn't have to say that. You didn't have to behave that way. And so that guilt is a good part. The right kind of guilt is a good thing uh, to get us on the right path. True guilt, I believe, is God's way of warning us to repent, to turn away from that area of sin in our life so that God can forgive us, so God can cleanse us and uh, make us entirely guilt-free. And that's what God desires is to live a guilt-free life. You know, they've got packaging now on, the, on food that uh, you can have a, a guilt-free uh, this and a guilt-free that. Uh, and then you can eat something that normally would cause you guilt, uh, but because it has certain ingredients in it, it's guilt-free. Uh, no need to feel guilt at, at all. Uh, but God says that, listen, I've got something that's really guilt-free for your life. And listen, we are our own worst enemy. Uh, your voice that you're hearing in your head today and throughout this, uh, your life uh, that's beating you up, uh, you are your own worst enemy. And uh, yeah, uh, you're far from what you ought to be. Uh, but uh, if it's under the blood and it's forgiven, it's gone. Gone, gone, gone. Yes, our sins are gone. Buried in the deepest sea, that's good enough. Amen. For you and I, it's gone. The buried in the deepest sea. And so good guilt is a good thing. Guilt is like an electric fence that gives us a jolt when we begin to stray beyond the boundaries. Uh, God doesn't want guilt to remain in our hearts. That's why he instructs us to confess our sins so we can deal with that guilt and deal with that conviction on the inside. Uh, That alarm is sent to wake us up uh, and that something needs our attention. Like pain, guilt tells you something's wrong. Something's not right, and uh, you got to get this thing fixed in your life. Husband and wife, maybe you have a little argument, a little, little tiff, and uh, you, you walk out to go to work, and, or you go out and leave the house for a moment, and uh, in your heart you're, you feel bad, and, and say, man, I, I, I feel bad, and I, I shouldn't have said that thing. That guilt is that little warning signal saying, listen, go back and apologize, and go back, say you're sorry, go back and get this thing right. And so that guilt is there to help us. In a, in a right way, in a right kind of guilt. Good guilt is a godly conviction. This type of guilt comes from the Spirit of God. And through the Spirit of God, our sin is brought to life. Good guilt helps us realize that our sin uh, is actually wrong. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, the Bible says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. In other words, godly sorrow is good. It's good to feel guilty. It's good to have the conviction of God. Uh, It's good to know that you did wrong and you said wrong and you acted wrong and you can get that thing right. It's just that warning signal to say, listen, that wasn't right. Now, if you don't listen to that guilt and that response, 
then we become uh, desensitized to the hurt that we cause. Uh, we become a little bit uh, uh, unaware of the pain that we brought to someone. And then we ought to feel bad when you do wrong. You ought to, I ought to feel bad. And I ought, I ought to feel that guilt and conviction in my heart when I do wrong. And when I don't feel wrong, then that's something that really is wrong. Uh, we ought to have that uh, awareness there. And so this good guilt helps us come to a place of repentance. Bad guilt, though, uh, leads to despair and hopelessness. And so because of what Jesus did on the cross, we don't have to live our lives in guilt. God wants us to live a guilt-free life. He knows we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We're all sinners, saved by grace, uh, through the mercy of God. And so we understand that. But today I want to focus upon the kind of God-given guilt. I'm going to focus on the accuser of the brethren kind of guilt. I'm going to focus on that bad guilt that Satan uses to keep you trapped in the past, that keeps you uh, uh, shackled to the mistakes of yesterday, that guilty past that holds you to the past and won't let you move forward with hope and anticipation and a fresh start and a new start. It holds you back, that accuser of the brethren type of guilt. I want today to help us learn how to silence, how to silence the accuser of the brethren for each and every one of us. And so it basically tells you, the accuser of the brethren says this, it, you're, you're never good enough. You're never good enough. Uh, anytime the enemy brings up your past failures, it's the work of this accusing spirit in your life. Uh, listen, God forgives. God forgets. And if, God, if, if the devil is reminding you of yesterday's mistakes and yesterday's failings and yesterday's shortcomings, God has not brought that up. That's that spirit of accusation from the accuser of the brethren that comes up and says you're no good, you're unworthy, you're undeserving. Yes, I understand that, but it's under the blood. I'm forgiven. God's given us a new start, a fresh start, a new beginning to be able to move forward in our lives. And so this spirit is accused of the brethren's spirit, uh, feeds on past mistakes in order to justify how that person is supposed to have failure. Even though you're under the blood of Jesus, you're still a failure. And God doesn't want to use you and that uh, you've uh, outlived your usefulness to God because you made this mistake, you made that mistake. Listen, aren't you glad that God forgives? And aren't you glad that God forgets? Aren't you glad that God gives you a new start? The Bible says the mercy of the Lord are what? They're new every day. Every morning, the mercy of the Lord are new in a part of account. This accusing spirit wants us to overlook or even discredit God's remedy for our failures. We failed. Jesus forgave. But this spirit of accusation keeps pointing to the mistake. If Christ uh, it hasn't erased it, as though he hadn't erased it, self-hate almost always involves the accusing spirit. Doubt, unbelief, fear, judgmentalism, critical spirit, resentment towards God, feelings of hopelessness, shame. The list can go on and on. That's the accuser of the brethren that holds you back, that ties you down, that wants to keep you back in the past. Sure, you made some mistakes. Sure, you could go back and you'd go back and do some things differently. But I can't go back. You can't go back. And the accuser of the brethren wants to keep you in the past because of all the bad, all the mistakes, all the sin that you've done yesterday and he wants to keep you shackled there and God says I want you to live a guilt free life Amen. a guilt free life uh, where that load of guilt and that, that, that burden of guilt is gone and it's no longer holding you captive uh, to the failings of yesterday Satan is a great accuser he loves to remind us of every failure, of every sin, of every bad choice, no matter how small it is, how big it is, he keeps a record. He brings it back to recall in your memory. Hey, remember when you did that? Remember when you said this? Remember how you lived that way? Remember how you acted that way? And he's always accurate to bring back exactly what we did. He brings it to the forefront of our mind. The accuser of the brethren. He whispers our failures in the most inconvenient times. Uh, unfortunately, Satan also exaggerates the impact. The sad news is that often we give him a microphone in our hearts and we give him free course to go ahead and say all those voices, all those things about us uh, that are true, that we did do wrong, we did mess up, it was a wrong choice, I did go down the wrong path, I did make a mistake, I did do wrong. And we give Satan the voice, so much so we listen to that voice that now that voice 
doesn't have to be the voice of the accused of the brethren. It now becomes our own voice. We've listened to that voice so long, we now believe it. And uh, we've listened to it over and over again. We now believe, yeah, I am a loser. I am a failure as a husband. I am a failure as a parent. I am a bad, yeah. And we begin to be our own voice. The accused of the brethren can go on to someone else because the job has been done. We've now become our own. We get up in the morning, see ourselves in the mirror, and we beat ourselves up throughout the day. And that voice now is our voice. Yet God is requesting all of us to live a guilt-free life. God wants to remind us uh, of His unbelievable promise of forgiveness and grace. If we confess our sins, He's faithful. He's just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, gone. Your sins are gone. They're forgiven. And guess what? They're cleansed. God says what? Guilt-free. But the devil doesn't forget what's been forgiven. And he doesn't want you to ever forget and me to forget what's been forgiven. So he continually brings it to the forefront of our minds until we begin to believe it and say, yeah, God can never do that for me. Yeah, I don't deserve that. And it's not I don't deserve that in the sense of, God, you're so good. I'm deserving of, undeserving of your goodness. It's a bad guilt. This is, yeah, I don't deserve that. It's a beating up yourself, uh, being your own worst critic and your own worst enemy. And so God promises forgiveness. And so we can, tr we can trust that God's forgiveness is real. Why? It's based on the character of God. For God is what? Faithful. God is what? Faithful. My forgiveness is not based upon my sincerity. My forgiveness is not based upon me not doing it again. My, my forgiveness is based on what? His character. The faithfulness of God. He is the one that forgives us. Praise God for the forgiveness of God. They're removed. Psalm 103 says, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. But though we're forgiven, though we're forgiven, the accuser of the brethren doesn't want us to feel forgiven. We often talk about uh, love languages in, in a couple. And uh, the love language of a couple, every, every, every individual has a, there's different love languages, but every person has a primary love language. Uh, and so a husband has a primary love language, and there's uh, five or six love languages you can have, and a wife has a primary love language. The problem that most of us do is we love, I love my wife the way I want to be loved, my primary love language. Our natural tendency is to love others the way our primary love language is the way we want to be loved. And so our spouse is loving us, the, uh, loving us the way they want to be loved. And so we've got a, a wife loving their husband the way they wish their husband would love them. We've got a husband loving their wife the way a husband wishes a wife would love them. And we're both loving each other, but we're not feeling loved by each other. We're not feeling loved. When you hit the love language of your spouse, they not only know that you love them because, well, I know my husband loves me. I just don't feel loved by my husband. I don't feel loved by my wife. But when you hit that love language, they now know it and they now feel it. I feel loved by my uh, husband. I feel loved by my wife. I feel loved by my mom and dad because you're hitting that love language. We can know uh, theologically, biblically, I can know that I'm forgiven. But do you feel forgiven? There's a difference. Oh, I know if we confess, I'm, faith, he's, I'm just forgiven. I'm forgiven. But do you feel forgiven? Now, if you, don't, if you have guilt, you don't feel forgiven. If you have regret, you don't feel forgiven. Uh, if you're beating yourself up, you, don't, you can say, oh, I know I'm forgiven. I know I'm forgiven. But that guilt says something else. It says you're not feeling forgiven. And God wants us to live this guilt-free life so we feel forgiven. There's something about living the Christian life with that load of guilt being lifted, that burden of guilt being gone, the shackles of the failures of yesterday being gone and cut free. And you live a guilt-free life feeling forgiven. Yes, you know you're forgiven. But you feel forgiven. And it's a liberating feeling that God wants you to have. That guilt-free life. Silencing the accuser of that voice that tells us and reminds us of the mistakes and, and uh, uh, failings of our yesterday and yesteryear. And so we see then the, the, the goal of Satan is to wear you down. And to make you weak as a child of God. Uh, and the accusing spirit is a fingers pointing spirit. It's a blaming spirit that specializes in digging up the past and blaming somebody for it. That somebody could be you, it could be others, 
and it could even be God. The accuser of the brethren, a uh, guilt works hand in hand with a critical spirit, judgmentalism. It robs you of your joy uh, with more guilt. Nothing robs you of your effectiveness to be used of God than more guilt. Nothing robs you of peace of mind than guilt. Nothing makes us more anxious and depressed than guilt. And so the accuser of the brethren, that demonic force that comes to your life to bring up and remind you of all the sin you've done, and you did do it. It's true, but it's forgiven. It's forgiven. And you have to remind the accuser of the brethren. You have to become a little bit more proactive and not just sort of backpedal uh, in fear. The Bible says what? Having done all stand and withstand, having on the armor of God, and don't allow the, the, the devil's accusations, though they are true and accurate, you did do that. You did live that way. You did act that way. But you go forth, forth, forthright against an accusation and say, but it's forgiven. I'm cleansed. It's guilt-free. I'm under the blood. It's cleansed. I'm free. And, and so you live that guilt-free life. Now, Satan doesn't want you to live that kind of life because we're held captive, we're shackled uh, to the past uh, in all those different areas of our life. And so the accuser, uh, guilt is one of the most crippling diseases among people today. Psychiatrists and doctors say that unresolved guilt is the number one cause of mental illnesses and suicide. The number one mental illnesses uh, and suicide is this area of unresolved guilt. It prompts millions of Americans to go down pills to tranquilize their anxiety. A study was done that estimated that the average person spends approximately two hours a day feeling guilty. Can you imagine how much of our life is wasted uh, looking back at, man, I, I wish I could live that over again. I wish I could do that over again. Uh, I feel so bad. You can't go back. You can't go back. What's been done is done. But you can live a guilt-free life. You can live a guilt-free life, but you've got to be proactive. You've got to take the choice. Yes, the accusations come, and the accuser says exactly what is true, what is exactly accurate, but it's only partially true because it's no longer defining who you are. It no longer defines the person that you are. Why? It's forgiven. It's cleansed. The guilt is gone. A Satan wants to make you feel bad continually. What a bad person you are. Uh, what, what a bad husband you are. What a bad wife you are. What a bad dad you are. What a bad mom you are. What a bad Christian you are. What a bad this you are. And he just wants to beat you up and beat you up. And though we give the accused of the brethren a microphone in our heart to hear the voice, oftentimes that mic is not given to the accused of the brethren. We take over the mic. And we now begin to say all these negative, painful things hurtful things about herself, uh, feeling bad continually. The voice of accusation becomes so familiar to us that it actually sounds like we're saying it to ourselves. It sounds like our voice. Satan disguised himself with our voice until in our minds we're accusing ourselves. And Satan's not even having to do anything about it because you're doing a good enough job yourself. You're beating yourself up enough. Why should Satan bother you? Uh, you're your own worst enemy. Why should Satan show up? You're hurting yourself more. You're paralyzing yourself more. You're shackling yourself to the past more than he can do. And so you're just guilt-driven and guilt-ridden. Now let me give you a couple of statements to help us to silence the accuser. Number one, we all make mistakes and do things we know we shouldn't. Hey, nail it down right there. We all make mistakes. And before you look around, your, our, our pharisaical knows that everybody else of how imperfect and how uh, bad everybody else is, let's realize we all make mistakes. We all fall short. We all do things uh, that we shouldn't do. It's easy to go around with a heaviness and feeling bad about ourselves, but the accuser of the brethren kind of guilt doesn't do anything productive. It doesn't help you do better. It causes you to struggle more. It drains you emotionally. Physically, it'll wear you out. When you're guilty, you get stuck. That's why the enemy works overtime, to keep you guilty, because you're in a rut. You're stuck. You can't keep going. You can't move forward. And so he maximizes his time to make you be your own worst enemy, the guilt. He wants you to go through this uh, life against yourself, focused on your failures, feeling unworthy. He's the accuser of the brethren, and he'll remind you everything you've done wrong 30 years ago. And he'll bring it right back as though it happened just yesterday. He'll remind you of it over and over again. He's a master. Even now, 
He's reminding you of all those things. Yeah, uh, yeah, you, you, don't, you, you don't listen to what the preacher is saying here. Uh, yeah, I understand you're forgiven, uh, but you, you don't, he don't, the preacher doesn't know what you've done. And the preacher, I mean, he's preaching in a broad sense, but he doesn't know how you've lived your life, and he doesn't know how bad of a person you are, and only you and the devil knows that, and, and uh, you, you don't deserve anything. Don't you believe that you're forgiven? Don't believe it's covered. Don't believe you can live a guilt-free life. Because a preacher, he doesn't know what you've done and how you've lived. I don't have to know. And I don't have to understand what, you do, what you've done and how you've lived. You don't have to know what I've done, how I've lived. I know this. God is faithful. And my forgiveness is not based upon myself. It's based on the character of God. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He goes and shows you you've made too many mistakes. You've failed too many times. You'll never get it right. And weren't, you weren't created to live in guilt. Had that nagging voice always telling you there's something wrong with you. You don't deserve to be happy. You just got to grunt and bear it. And uh, you know what? You've made a mess of your life and you have to live in this mess. You've dug this hole. You have to live in this hole. You're stuck. And that's what guilt does. It just keeps you hopeless, helpless with no light at the end of the tunnel. And that's not the life that God wants us to live. But that's the room full of people today. That's who we are. We're prone to allow ourselves to be our own worst enemy. We beat ourselves up. Something bad happens to someone else. We blame ourselves. Something don't over here. We blame ourselves. Oh, if I would have done this, or I would have done that. If I didn't say that, if I didn't say this. And we put all that guilt, all that blame on ourselves. And so we see that over and over again. And so today, maybe you're carrying the weight of guilt, the weight of shame. The weight of regret. You know, it's time to lay aside that weight. Let us lay aside every sin and what doth weight that doth set before us and run the race with patience the, the set before us. Listen, that weight of regret. Oh, I've got preacher, I've got so much regret. I, I got so much shame. I'm embarrassed how I live my life. I've got so much guilt. Paul, let me tell you, there's a God in heaven that has so much more love, so much more mercy, so much more grace, and the character of God is faithful to what? Give you a guilt-free life, a clean slate. A clean start, a new beginning in your life, wherever we are in life today. Oh, let me give you a verse. I love this verse. This is one that maybe should be a life verse for many of us, if not all of us. Go to 1 John chapter number 3. 1 John chapter 3. And no matter what you feel like, no matter how many mistakes you've made, no matter how far you've fallen short, you can live a life where you don't have to live in guilt. You can live a life, a guilt-free life. The devil is going to remind you over and over again. But you've got to realize that's what he does. He's an accuser of the brethren. That's what he specializes in, to remind you. So you can then remind yourself and repeat to yourself over and over again all those things that the devil has reminded you about. Look in 1 John, 1 John chapter number 3. Look with me down in verse number 20. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 20. For if our heart condemn us, What's that? Self-condemnation. What's that? Guilt. Regret. Remorse. Oh, I wish I didn't. I wish I could have. I wish I could undo it. I wish I could go back. If our heart condemn us. Now, if we stop right there, there's not much hope, but it gets exciting. Look on. Look here. But what? God is greater than our heart. Oh, I'm glad my heart doesn't define who I am. I'm glad the emotion of guilt doesn't define who I am because God is greater than my emotion of guilt. God is greater than the deception of my own heart that's desperately wicked and who can know it. Though your heart condemned you, God is greater than what? Your heart. And then it goes on to say what? And knoweth all things. God knows everything that Satan's reminding you about. God knows all things. But listen, there's one thing about it. Verse 21 Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Listen to what it says. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. He's not saying if you don't sin, then you can have confidence toward God. He's saying if your heart doesn't condemn you, then you have confidence towards God. Because even if I fail and fall and stumble, I don't, I, I don't have confidence today because... I'm not what I ought to be, but I've got confidence because what? I'm forgiven. I'm not under guilt. See, you can't live a confident Christian life 
when you're bogged down with guilt. You can't live a confident Christian life uh, if the burden of guilt is holding you shackled to the failings of yesterday. The Bible says, if our heart condemn us not, what? You've got confidence with God. There's a boldness in your prayer life. There's a boldness in your witnessing. There's a boldness in living for God. Not because you're sinless. Not because you're not struggling. Not because you haven't fallen. But because you're not allowing the fall to cause you to be guilt-ridden. And you're not living a guilt-free life. God says there's confidence when there's guilt-free living. Now, it doesn't condone the wrong that was done. But when you take it to Jesus and confess it and get that thing right, then God says, gone. It's forgiven. It's claimed. And so today, if you don't have confidence, that confidence may be the result of guilt is keeping you from living a confident life. You're a little doubting in your prayer life. You don't go to God boldly, as he says, come boldly to the throne of grace. You're not going to go boldly. Uh, Why? Because you've got all this guilt. And guilt doesn't allow you to approach God boldly. Uh, You see, if I fall or stumble, it doesn't change the fact that I'm in the righteousness of God. I'm not in my own righteousness. Listen, it's not my righteousness that keeps me in the hand of God. It's His righteousness that got me there. It's His righteousness that keeps me there. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm saved because of His righteousness. I'm not saved because of my, all of our righteousness, Isaiah says. There's what? Filthy rags. Oil rags. There's nothing in our righteousness that can gain favor and merit with God. And so I'm saved because of His righteousness. I'm held secure because of His righteousness. And I'm guilt free because of what? His righteousness. I'll still do wrong. I'll still fall. I'll still falter. I'll still sin. But bless God, I don't have to live a guilt ridden life if I confess it, get it right with God, and move forward victorious. Knowing I've got, I've got confidence. I'm not going to let that happen again. God, we're not going down that path again. I'm not going to go that path of sin again. There's a confidence that you have to live victorious over sin. Why? Because the guilt is gone. But when you live in guilt, you're drawn back into the sin. Because you don't have confidence. Are you going to get victory over that? I, I, I hope so. I hope so. I, I don't know if I can. It's a tough one. I've tried so many times. Preacher, get a handle on this thing and and it just seems to always come back like a vengeance and grab a hold of me. Now, your problem is not the sin. Your problem is the guilt that's attached to the sin that you forgot to detach from the forgiveness that came with your confession when you came to God for forgiveness. And that guilt is keeping you bondage and say, I don't, I don't have confidence. I can't do it. No, when, you're, when that guilt is gone, there's that confidence that you have. And so, in other words, if your heart does not condemn you, if you have the confidence before God, there's only one way to be free from guilt. Here it is. Let's go to Hebrews. Let me give you a few verses, and uh, we'll be done. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. That's a good verse in 1 John, right? Mark that one down, as you'll want to go back to that one, because your heart will condemn you. And when it does, go to that next verse. God's greater. God's greater. God's greater. Listen, don't allow your emotion of guilt to become your God and your idol. Don't you allow that emotion of regret to become the focal point of your idolatry. No, sir. You put aside that regret. Put aside that guilt. And say, I'm going to exalt Jesus. He's going to be Lord of Lord of my life. I'm going to make him the preeminent one. Why? Because he's the one worthy. Uh, to be praised. He's the one worthy to be magnified. My focus is not on my failings. My focus is on the forgiving God that's forgiven me. Here's the verse. Look in uh, Hebrews. Got it? Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. Here's the only way to be free from guilt. It starts right here. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. So our guilty conscience has been sprinkled with the blood of Christ to make us clean. He doesn't say our apology makes us clean. He doesn't say turning over a new leaf makes us clean. What did we sing about this morning? Over and over again, what was it? The blood of Jesus was in those songs. We're singing about the blood of Christ. What makes us clean? What, what gives us a, a clean conscience? It's, it's out of the blood. It's forgiven. It's under the blood. It's paid in full. The transaction has been paid. And so that evil conscience, that guilt, is under the blood. It's not based on anything I've done. It's based on all that he's done. And so look at the next. Let's go. Uh, he says only one thing. Uh, but he says this about a guilty conscience. In 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. All water and many other solvents can wash away physical dirt, but no good deed can wash away the guilt of sin. No uh, turning over a new leaf can wash away the guilt of sin. But listen, the blood of Jesus Christ can wash that sin and cleanse you and make you whole. All sins are washed away. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing can wash my sin away but what? But the blood of Jesus. There's power, power, wonder working power in the blood. Why? The forgiveness of the power of that blood, that sinless, spotless blood that was shed as a lamb without spot was shed and slain for us. And so we see that many people don't understand how blood can take away our sin. Let me give you how that takes place. Since death, is a means, uh, uh, since death uh, is just penalty for sin, the only way God can preserve righteousness uh, in, in our sinfulness, uh, the only way He can preserve that and forgive sin is for someone else who is without sin to shed their blood for you and I who are in sin. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, the Bible says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your souls. Leviticus 17, 11. Now the first part of that verse, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Years ago, years ago they would do what was called bloodletting. And they thought if someone was sick, the problem was in the blood. And uh, someone wasn't healthy, the problem was blood. So what they want to do? They, they did bloodletting. They would take the blood out of their system. They'd take it out because that was the problem. And now we've learned these many years later that uh, now there, there's thousands of tests, blood tests, that are taken to find out your, 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 your blood glucose or your cholesterol or your thousands of other things. And where's the life is found? It's in the blood. It's in the life. Found then it goes on to say, it's the blood that makes an atonement for sin. See, atonement's a satisfaction for an offense that was done, resulting in the restoration of a broken relationship. That's why in Hebrews 9, 22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. If blood is not shed, forgiveness cannot be given. That's why Jesus could not die in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because the blood had to be shed. That's why Jesus couldn't have drowned and been successful. The blood... That's why he couldn't have been strangled, because the blood had to be shed. Because when John the Baptist saw the Lamb of God, Jesus kind of said, Behold, the Lamb of God, not that atones for sins, not that covers our sins, but removes our sins, that takes our sin away. Behold, the Lamb of God is come to take what? The sin away. And so we no longer have to live under that guilt if we come to Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. But the blood has to be applied. That's why your church membership can't, can't uh, remove the guilt. That's why your confirmation can't remove the guilt. That's why your, uh, your uh, uh, communion can't remove the guilt. That's why your baptism can't remove the guilt. Uh, your, your, who you're affiliated, your good works can't remove the guilt. The blood has to be shed. And the only blood that can be applied that can bring forgiveness is the sinless shed blood of Jesus Christ. It was shed for us on the cross. Because there's forgiving, there's, there's, there's forgiving power in that blood of Jesus Christ. You see, under the old covenant, there was an atonement through the blood of sacrificial animals. That was a prefiguring of the blood of Christ. Hebrews 10.4. Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It's not possible. But why do they do all those Old Testament sacrifices? Because it was a, an atonement looking forward to when Christ would be the ultimate sacrifice. See, in the Old Testament, they looked forward to Christ. We today look back to Christ. Same focal point, same focal point in our lives is Christ and the shed blood of Jesus Christ in our lives. And so Christ could pay the penalty for our sins because he was without sin. He was a sacrifice in place of us. He was not under the same condemnation. He could voluntarily take our place, 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Listen, we're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, through the propitiation, what? By his blood, through faith. Ephesians 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I say, listen, we all make mistakes. We all do things we shouldn't do but number two you can't drag yesterday's failures into today and live in victory you can't drag 
yesterday's failures into today and live in victory. Can you go to Philippians chapter 3? We're almost in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 13. Philippians 3, verse number 13. You cannot drag yesterday's failings, failures uh, into today through those guilt, you know, that self-condemnation, uh, your heart condemning you, and live in victory. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, Paul says, I count not myself to, I've not arrived, I've not apprehended, but this one thing I do. Hey, you know what gave him victory? You know what gave him power? Here it is. This one thing, forgetting, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth on those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of high calling in God and Christ Jesus. Forgetting is stop dwelling on something. Quit allowing your failings of yesterday. Your failings of yesterday, let them not hold you back. Listen, forget it. Forget it. And press on. There's a race to be run. There's a life to be lived. Yeah, we've made mistakes. Yeah, we wish we could go back and undo it. Yeah, we can wish we could go back and unsay it. Yeah, we wish we could do that. We can't. But you can live a guilt-free life if you silence the accuser and say, listen, accuser, you're not welcome here. I'm not going to hear the voice of the accusation because I, I, I'm secure in Christ. It's by his righteousness. I'm held in the hands of God, not by my righteousness. I'm cleansed. I'm forgiven. The sins are gone. They're forgotten about. And you remind the accuser of the brethren, you have no accusation against me. You take it up with the Father. You take it up with the Father. Those are false accusations. And uh, you take it up uh, with God the Father. Too often uh, you watch the returns of your past sins and mistakes and the uh, reruns of the past and you feel guilty. You ask forgiveness again and again and again. But nothing seems to be happening because you feel unworthy. You feel unloved. You feel condemned. And the moment you ask God to forgive you, He not only forgives you, He doesn't remember those sins anymore. They're gone. They're gone. And you, in fact, it's, a, it's an insult to God. For you to continually go back and ask forgiveness for what he already forgave you for. Because God says, what are you talking about? Well, you know, you know that thing, I just feel so bad and I, I shouldn't have done that. God says, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't feel so bad if I didn't. And God says, listen, don't insult God by saying his forgiveness is not complete and in full when you ask for it the first time. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he died once and for all. And when he said, it is finished, what needed to be done was done. It's finished. And so I go to God all the time, oh, God, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. God, forgive me. And okay, listen, you're waiting for a feeling that, that you're not going to get because God's already forgiven you. You have to silence the voice of accuser you got to silence the accuser because that voice is not the voice of God. God says, I have no idea what sin you're talking about. None whatsoever. Uh, and so and let me just say this. Nothing, this is the last point. Nothing you've done in the past is too much for the mercy of God. Nothing that you've done in the past is too much for the mercy of God. And I love mercy because mercy says this, I don't get what I deserve. That's mercy. That's mercy. And I start the message saying, oh, we don't deserve that. And we don't. We don't deserve God's goodness. I'm talking about this bad guilt that leaves you feeling so beaten up that, that you're just so undeserving. Not in a good way undeserving, but in a self-focused undeserving. Woe was me. I'm such a bad person. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, we see this over and over again. And so God says, my mercy is well able to care for what you're doing. Once you ask for forgiveness... You don't have, to, to, you don't have to, uh, to, to pay God back. The price has already been paid. You don't have to pay penance. You don't have to go through, you don't have to go through some, you know, whatever to gain favor back with God. When he, when he paid your sin debt, the stamp was put on, paid in full. There's no other payments. It's paid. And so when you're trying to pay God, well, i got to just really show God how sincere I am. There's nothing to pay back God. Just start living for God. Just live for God and out, of, out of gratefulness and gratitude. And, uh, you know, no, no, as soon as Jonah was on dry ground, we see this story in Jonah. Jonah made this mistake. Um, and um, 
uh, God had told him, you know, to go and, and preach to Nineveh, and he ran and fled in, in the other direction. You know the story. He spent three days in the belly of, of that fish, and when the fish finally spit him out of the, on dry ground, uh, you would think God would say, Jonah, you need to sit on the sidelines for a while and think this thing over. But as soon as he spit him on the ground, now he tried to sit on that, that uh, gore, that juniper, you know, trying to feel sorry for himself, and woe is me, and God will never use me, bad guilt. But as soon as God placed him on that dry ground, he set him there to get running, to go forward. He said, I want you to go to Nineveh. I haven't changed my mind. Even though you messed up the first time, I still need you to go. Even though you didn't do right the first time, I still need you to do right th this time. And he said, I want you to go. And, and the Bible says in Jonah 3, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, here it is, the second time. Aren't you glad we serve a God that gives us chance after chance after chance? We're all multi-chanced Christians that has had multiple, multiple chances beyond what we ever deserve. But God says, I've got a purpose for your life. And Satan fighting you hard by trying to keep you shackled to the, the pain and the hurt and the, 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 the failings of the past. He said, go the second time, arise, verse 2, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto, the, preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So God was in effect saying, Jonah, you made a mistake. You got off course. But you repented. You asked forgiveness. Now get back in the game. Get back in the game. You've sat on the sidelines long enough. Uh, you, you've you've uh, wallowed in your self-pity long enough. All right, listen, you, it's, it's forgiven. All right, you made some mistakes. Uh, you've learned some things through that mistake. But listen, it's time to get back in the game. It's time to get back serving. It's time to get back living for God. It's time to get back and you can live a guilt-free life. Silence the accuser. Listen, don't you give that microphone to the accuser of the brethren. He's going to remind you of all your past. He's going to say you're no good. He's going to make you feel bad continually. Or he can say, Satan, get out of here. In the name of Jesus, with the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God. God has a purpose. Now I'm moving forward and doing something for God. Will you fall again? Will you fail? Will you stumble? As it's written, there's none righteous. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Listen, are you letting your mistake that you made or some way you fell convince you that God won't have anything to do with you right now? Maybe one day he'll use you. Maybe one day he'll help accomplish your dream. No, God's saying to what you said to Jonah, get back in the game. I've got something for you to do now. There's people that need your influence now. There's folks that need your help now. Listen, get back in the game. And what Satan wants you to do? He wants you stuck in that rut of self-pity and guilt. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Here's a conclusion. Know that you're loved by God. Know that you're forgiven by God and know that the mercies of God are new every morning. That's the message. That's the message. How do you silence the accuser? Know God loves you. Because God, the devil wants to convince you, the accuser of the brother wants to convince you, why would God love you? Live in the way you live. And know that God what? Forgive. When you go to God and says, God, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. God says, I'll forgive. And then he says, know that the mercies of God are new every morning. I'm glad the mercies of God aren't just January 1st of every year. We've got to wait 365 days for a new start. I'm glad every morning you wake up as God's mercies. Man, I blew it yesterday, but today is going to be the day. God, the mercies, of, they're new. What's that mean? I'm not getting what I deserve, but God's giving me another chance. Know your love, know you're forgiven, and know the mercies of God are new every morning. Father, we thank you.